And so today we come into your presence filled with gratitude, with hope, with thanksgiving. And we want to hold on to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who is the one who gave himself to redeem us. Father, we are yours, and we ask now that you would speak to us, your sons and daughters, in Jesus' name. I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. If you don't have a, a Bible or a Bible app on your uh, phone or on your device, then uh, grab one of the Bibles that's in the pews around you. I want you to uh, uh, feel free to use it, and if you need one, feel free to take it. Uh, we're fine with that. That's why they're there. We want you to have the Word of God and let it be part of your life. Uh, we are wrapping up our series today. Uh, we spent eight weeks asking the question, are you happy? And uh, uh, we've been looking at the words of Jesus as he taught in Matthew 5, a, a section called the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, about how he defined happiness, how he defined joy, how he defined the blessed life. And one of the things that we've seen week in and week out is that Jesus' way to happiness and the world's way to happiness are in contrast, and it's never more obvious than in today's text. Uh, I invite you to follow along with me, Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3, where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why don't you think about that for a minute? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Really? Because most of us automatically equate happiness with the absence of pain. Right? Anybody here wake up this morning going, oh, boy, I hope I hurt bad today. <laughs> no, you know, you, we, we kind of think that way. That's our default mode. In fact, that's the way the world thinks. The world pretty much says, hey, happiness equals no suffering, no pain. Happiness is, is all about having that pain-free life. That, that's why our society, our culture spends billions of dollars on these things called pain killers. Right? Because we hate pain. We don't just want to tolerate it. We want to kill it. And if we can't get the prescriptions, then we self-medicate and we spend billions of dollars on, on ways that, that we don't have to feel the pain, even though it comes back in the morning. And, and so the world says happiness equals no pain and suffering, but Jesus offers a different way. His equation for happiness is this. He says happiness equals pain and suffering for him. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for a purpose. And, and that doesn't really compute with us. Now, now, most of us in this room are already Jesus followers. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. We believe that He died on the cross to pay for our sins and that He was raised from the dead, and we have made a commitment, most of us in here have already made a commitment to follow Jesus with our lives. And, and what that means is that we believe Jesus, what He teaches, and we want to apply what He teaches to our lives because we know that He's going to lead us to happiness. We know he's going to lead us to blessing. And, and so we've got to struggle with how do we make sense of this crazy statement that blessed are those who are persecuted, who suffer for the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, that's what we're going to try to do. I'm going to invite you to go with me on this journey as we walk through this and try to understand it. And it begins with a brief biblical perspective on pain and suffering. Got to kind of get the big picture, lay the foundation so we know what God's Word says on this whole subject of pain in the first place. Uh, it begins with just uh, saying that pain and suffering are reality of life. 
It's a reality of life. Romans chapter 5. We're going to look at some verses in Romans 5. Uh, they're going to pop up on your screen in a minute, so you can turn there or mark it or um, just follow along. Verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That, that's our situation. God created a perfect world. We messed it up. That, that's the reality. And, and so we're the ones who, who are living in a world of sin and death and pain. And, and I'm pretty sure that applies to all of us. Anyone here living a pain-free life? Oh, good, I don't have to preach on lying now. Uh, so <laughs> the reality is we're all touched by the, the suffering, by loss, by disappointments, by failures, by tragedy, by aging. Anybody noticing that? You know, I often wonder, why didn't they tell us it was going to hurt this much? And then I realized they did, and we weren't listening, right? Because they're old people. What do they know? And, uh, but uh, that's a reality. So pain and suffering is a reality of life, and pain and suffering is a result of rebellion. Same verse, I, I, again, don't know if you noticed this, tells us why we hurt, but it also says, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all because all sinned. Yeah, we joined in the rebellion, and, and so I, I really hate to point this out, but um, pain and suffering isn't God's fault. It, it's our fault. He created the perfect world. We messed it up, and we continue to sin, which means that we add to our pain and suffering uh, on the personal level, but also in the world. Okay, so pain and suffering, reality of life, results of rebellion. And, and then we need to know that pain and suffering are redeemed by God. Uh, God actually decided to not leave us in the mess that we created. And he's been working to redeem our suffering and our brokenness ever since the garden. So how does God redeem our suffering? Uh, first of all, God redeems our suffering by building the character of Christ in us. He builds the character of Christ Again, Romans chapter 5, it's a great passage on uh, pain and suffering, so you may want to revisit it and read it later. Beginning in verse 3, he says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Um. Most of you are followers of Jesus Christ, and so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, how many of you want to be like Jesus? Okay, we want to be like Jesus. And, and we say that, we have slogans like, hey, what would Jesus do? And, and we want to follow Jesus, and so we say we want to be him, like him, but if we want to be like him, then here's the thing, we need to change. Because I am not like Jesus. I'm going to guess that you're not quite there yet either. Right? And so we need to change. But how many of us really love to change so much that as soon as God points out something in his word or we hear something in a sermon or God kind of speaks to us that we just go, I'm going to change right now and I'm going to do exactly what God wants. Yeah, that's not our reaction, is it? No, we resist it. We go, oh, I need to change. I know I need to do that. I need to obey, but I don't do it. So here's what God does. He uses pain to motivate us to change. He uses the suffering that we brought on ourselves in our own lives and that the world visits us so that we will be drawn into a relationship with him where he can shape our character and mold us to look like Jesus. Didn't you catch that in the, in the progression? Paul says, I rejoice in our suffering because suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope is what sustains us when times are tough. It doesn't disappoint. And, and so when we encounter that place of suffering and pain, whatever the reason, then God is redeeming it by building the character of Christ in us to make us look like Jesus. By the way, let me encourage you not to blame God for your pain. Because a lot of us do that, right? A, a lot of us uh, blame God and we, we ask the question, why? Why? And we don't ask it reasonably. Usually it's kind of accusatory and we're praying at something like this because bad stuff happens, our world falls apart, there's lots of pain, and what do we do? We lift up our eyes and we go to God, why? 
Why are you doing this to me? Why now? Why this? Why, you know, and we fill in the blank with all the whys. And you know what I found when I pray that way? Is that God doesn't feel compelled to answer me. He, he probably does the same with you too. Because he, he, that's the wrong question. We couldn't understand it. I think if God answered a question and gave us a glimpse of what he's really doing, our heads would just explode anyway. The question we need to ask is how? God, how do you want to use this struggle to shape me to look like Jesus? How do you want to use this pain to move me to where I can be more like your son and more like you and reflect the character of Christ? And that's where the joy is going to be found because you're going to redeem this hurt. If that doesn't really help you, if that's a place where you're struggling and and, uh, that kind of stuff, then think about this. I want to share with you my favorite Facebook quote. Um, I, I read lots of them, and I laugh at a lot of them. This one just went, I went, this is good. I've got to share this. So I did on my, on my Facebook, but um, I, I, I thought I'd share it with you guys too. And, and it's a reaction to that blaming of God because uh, a lot of times we, even as we're trying to express our faith, we blame God without realizing it. Have you ever heard someone say, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And usually when they say everything happens for a reason, what they're saying is God's doing this and we just don't know why, but he's got a purpose. So here's my response gently through Facebook (laughs) that uh, goes like this. Everything happens for a reason. But sometimes the reason is that I'm stupid and I made bad decisions. (laughs) So uh, actually, they I think on Facebook it said uh, because you're stupid and you made bad decisions. But I'm stupid and I make bad decisions, so it kind of works for me. So God redeems our suffering by building the character of Christ. And God redeems our suffering because he works in the circumstances. He works in the circumstances, whatever the, that, those are. Romans 8, 28 is a great promise uh, of that God is working in our lives. It says, and we know that for those who love God, so if you love God, this applies to you. For those that love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You catch that? All things work together for good. doesn't say that all things are good. doesn't say that God causes all things to be good. What he says is in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our failure, in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of all that we're going through, God is there and he's picking up the broken pieces of our life and putting them together to make something beautiful. Now, we want to understand it. We want to see it. We want to know what it's going to look like, but we can't see it in those moments. All we can know is that God is there and he's holding on to us and he's not going to let us go and he's going to see us through and he's going to do something redemptive in our lives because he promises that he's going to do that. So God redeems our suffering. He builds the character of Christ. He works in our circumstances. And of course, God redeems our suffering through heaven. Through heaven. Did you catch that when Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 12 of Matthew 5, he says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Yeah. See, here's how it works. The promise is that one day we're going to trade in this broken, messed up, pain-filled, destructive world, and it's going to all be done away with, and we're going to inhabit a perfect place, a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, where there is no more pain, suffering, sorrow, death, or destruction, disease, tragedies. All that stuff is done away with. And we hold on to that hope because that hope is Jesus came into this world to forgive us of our sins so that we could go there one day. And that day is sooner than you think. Scripture tells us over and over and over again that our lives are just like a mist, a vapor that's here for a moment and then it's gone. And we all affirm that by saying, look how fast time goes. Look how fast our kids grow up. Look how how fast this year went by. We say that all the time. We're affirming Scripture when we say that, and we recognize that. It's just for a moment. And so if your life is filled with pain and suffering and tragedy and agony, and you're not sure how you can go on, and you're not sure if you want to go on, and you're you're going, I'm just struggling with this, then I want to give a verse to you that needs to become your life verse. I think it was the Apostle Paul's life verse. Romans 8, 18. And you're going to have to write it down and look it up because we're not going to pop it on the screen Uh, because I didn't give them heads up enough. (laughs) It goes like this in the NIV. For I do not consider this present suffering worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul's saying? 
He's saying, look, this world hurts, but it only hurts for a moment. And there are an eternity of moments waiting for me where there is no more pain and suffering and sorrow and death. And I'm holding on to the promise of those moments because when I get there, what I went through here, nothing. Doesn't matter. Small potatoes. I'm not even going to remember it. I'm not going to care because it's all going to fade away into the glory of God that I'm going to step into and the love of Christ. It's real in my life. And he, and he shares that because that's his struggle because his life was filled with pain. His life was filled with persecution. And he shares that saying, hey, look, all of us who are in Christ, we have that same hope and God's going to redeem. And, and we know that. And we can make it through the pain today. Because of that promise of tomorrow. So that's God redeeming our suffering. And that's a brief look at a biblical perspective on pain and suffering. Now I want to talk about rejoicing in persecution. Because that's what Jesus is calling us to do. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who are before you. And he meant it when he said it. And we read these words, and honestly, as American Christians, we don't really have to struggle with persecution uh, for our faith on a daily basis. We really don't, because the founding fathers that came here, came here because of religious persecution, and they wanted freedom to be built into our system, and so they designed the most brilliant system in the history of the world, and now we live in the greatest nation in the world because we have freedom like no one else. And so when we read this stuff about persecution, you know, we go, uh, yeah, okay, the, I understand the concept, but not the reality. Because, hey, you came here today, and you weren't really worried about someone arresting you for showing up in church. And you came here today, and you're not really afraid that when you walk out in the parking lot, someone's going to beat you because you call yourself a Christian. And, and, and I met someone after the last service who just trusted Christ, and no one is going to come and tell them that if they continue to con consider uh, Christianity as their new way of life, that they're going to kill them because you can't do that. See, we don't live in that reality. But I want you to understand that that reality exists. There is persecution today in the world. Let me just share some facts and figures with you that, that you may not be aware of. The United States State Department says that there are 60 countries in the world with ongoing active persecution of Christians. Either where the government itself is persecuting believers or the government is turning a blind eye while organized groups target and, and hurt Christians, kill Christians. Estimates are that last year, up to 165,000 Christians died for their faith in this world. You don't see that in the headlines. It should be in the headlines, but it's not there. Uh, up to 10% of the Christians in the world, or 200 million people who identify themselves as Christians, face daily persecution or the threat of it. Uh, if you do read the headlines, you saw that in the past 12 months, churches have been burned or bombed in Egypt, Nigeria, Pakistan, Iraq, Indonesia, and other places around the world. This is present and ongoing. Um, and, and it's getting intense in places like the Middle East. Uh, there used to be a thriving Christian community in Iraq. But in the last 10 years, that community has been targeted and driven from the country. There's just a handful of Christians now in Iraq. In Egypt, uh, with all their political turmoil that's been going on, the, the Coptic Christians, 10% of the Egyptian population can hardly meet in public without fear of attack or, or their houses or their businesses being bombed or burned. That's ongoing today. In, in Syria, where uh, you know, some of the earliest Christians were, I mean, think about it, Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus. It's still the capital of Syria. He was on the way to Damascus. Some of the earliest Christians resided in Syria, and, and, and yet now they are being targeted. Christians in Syria are being targeted by the opposition to the tyrant uh, for extinction. For extinction. They, they, their goal is to drive every Christian out of the country or to kill them. That's what's happening in the world today, and there's more stories like that. I don't have time to tell you, but if you're interested, we've got some magazines, some newsletters for Voice of the Martyrs, at the Connection Center on your way out. And we're going to run out of them because we have in every service. But uh, the, there's some there for you. So if you grab one of those, great. If you want to know more about it, Google Voice of the Martyrs. They are a Christian organization that is the voice for the persecuted church. And, and there's, they'll send you free stuff. They'll inform you uh, with newsletters and things like that. So uh, check that out if you want to know more. So 
There's persecution today. We need to know that. We also need to see and understand the response of the apostles. The early church was a persecuted church. And, and if you look at uh, a passage in Matthew 5, it's at the end of the, the story of the apostles all being arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. Uh, that, that were, that they're the same people that condemned Jesus to death, and the Sanhedrin talked about killing them. And it picks up in verse 40. It says, And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing, that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Rejoicing. Because they had been scourged the same way that Jesus was before they crucified him. Rejoicing in the fact that they had been arrested unjustly and beaten unjustly, and they walked out. I don't think we would respond the same way. I mean, because we're American Christians. If someone arrests us and beats us for, for being a Christian, what are we doing when we're walking out of jail? We're calling a lawyer. We're filing grievances. Our civil rights have been violated. We're going to be suing them. We're going to be, you know. And, and they walked out rejoicing. And by the way, that's not the first time that they did that. In Acts chapter 4, they, after they arrested Peter and John and threatened them, the church got together and they prayed. And, and you know what they prayed for? Boldness. Courage. They didn't didn't ask God to remove the the persecutors. They didn't ask God for safety. They said, God, they're threatening us. We don't want to be afraid. We want to be bold. These people understood something that maybe we struggle to grasp. And that is that God reveals himself to those who suffer with him and for him. God reveals himself to those who suffer with him and for him. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I'm pretty sure that every one of us in here wants to know Christ. That's why we're here. We want to get closer to God. We want to understand. And, And what Paul is saying is that part of understanding God's heart, part of understanding Jesus is entering into his suffering. Now, we're not really facing persecution in America. We've already talked about that. But here's the thing. Your pain, your suffering, is an opportunity for you to connect with the heart of God. Because God hurts for his people. Jesus entered into this world that that was broken and messed up and and took on our suffering and our pain and our grief and our loss and, and, and ended up dying for it. And so when we encounter suffering, whether it's your grief for a child and their choices or or the the loss of a loved one or the pain of failure or rejection, then you can get in touch with God because he understands and you can connect with his heart in a way that you can't any other way. If you want to know Christ, if you want God revealed and real in your life, then understand that journey is going to involve suffering. It's going to involve suffering. Besides that, the the apostles rejoiced because they heard Jesus say, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. They weren't clinging to the comfort of this world. They were holding on to the hope that God was really going to bless them because of their choices. So what's our response? Uh, we already talked about this. We're American Christians. We don't really face the threat of persecution today. And, and uh, what do we need to do? What do we need to walk out of here with uh, some understanding? I mean, some of you are already interested in, in knowing more about Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, here's three things that I want to challenge you to do. First of all, pray. Pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering persecution. Even though you may never taste it, family members are. Get informed. Understand what's happening. Get involved however God leads you, but, but be praying for them. Be praying for them. Secondly, vote. Uh, get involved in the political process because we are entrusted as Americans with the opportunity to speak into our political process. That is a gift from God. We didn't ask for it. We just were born into it. And so we need to take that responsibility seriously because religious freedom is under assault right now. If you, if you read the headlines at all, there's, there's a battle over whether or not we get to exercise our faith in the way that we choose. Uh, the Catholic Church is fighting with the government over the, the mandatory birth control because that violates one of the key tenets of Catholic teaching. 
That's a religious freedom issue. And, and how we define uh, marriage is a religious freedom issue. I mean, people can define marriage however they want to, but telling us that we can't teach what the Bible says and declare it publicly without it being labeled as hate speech it is a religious freedom issue. I mean, we're not told to hate anybody. We're not going to hate anybody. But if we can't practice what Scripture says, then, then that's an issue of religious freedom. And, and here's the thing. When you go to the polls, don't, don't just vote your pocketbook or vote your preferences. Vote for freedom. Support religious freedom because, again, it's a gift that God gave to us because our founding fathers were brilliant. And, and we need to make sure that it, uh, we continue to protect it for everybody. For everybody. And then finally, prepare. Prepare. Jesus told us that the world was going to hate us because it hated him. He said, don't be shocked at persecution. Don't be so shocked at the pain and suffering the world brings you because the world hated me first, and if it hated me, it's going to hate you. Which ought to change our perspective because a lot of times when people say nasty stuff about us or, or accuse us of things or whatever, we, we kind of come to God and go, God, did you hear what they said about me? Did you hear what they're doing? And God's going, um, my poor stupid child, I told you this. Why are you coming in tears and whining about it when I said, hey, guess what, guys? The world hated me. They're going to hate you. They killed me. They're going to kill you. That, that's part of the deal. That's how it works. And so we need to be prepared. Now, we don't face persecution in our country, but what if things changed drastically? And by the way, they would have to change drastically. We're not talking about small things. And we really did face persecution, fines, imprisonment, or death. Are you prepared? Do you have the attitude and faith of the apostles? Would you rejoice knowing that God would redeem your suffering? And, and, and I know that a lot of us were raised on the idea, as American Christians, that, hey, don't worry about it. We're not going to really have to ever face persecution before, because before it gets bad, God's going to pull us out of there in this thing called the rapture. And we kind of grew up with that, oh, good, I don't have to worry about that. Think about this. How messed up is it if we are excited about missing out on a blessing? See, we're, we're going, hey, God, I want you to get us out of here before things get bad. I don't want to hurt and suffer for you. And Jesus is saying, hey, uh, wait a minute, I said blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. See, we've got our minds set on exactly the wrong thing. We need to say, God, I want to be prepared for whatever you bring my way. God, I want to be prepared that if you ask me to, that I am willing to suffer and die for you because you are willing to suffer and die for me. Instead of just hoping and praying that we're not going to have to suffer. See, that, that's that attitude change. That, that's that whole way of thinking differently that leads to happiness, that leads to joy, that leads to the blessed life because we stop holding on to the things of this world and the comfort that we live in, and instead we hold on to Jesus. And our hope is in Jesus, and our life is wrapped up in Jesus. And here's where it boils down to. Do we take seriously the Word of God? Do we take seriously Jesus so that we actually believe him and apply it to our lives? Or do we just read the words and go, that's nice, and go on? See, here's the tough part. Most of us don't take Jesus enough seriously to live for him. So it's doubtful we take him serious enough to die for him. So what does this look like in a real practical sense? I'm going to share something with you that, that it came out in a conversation I had with another person. And they said, hey, when, you, when you're preaching this, share this. Because it really challenged him to think. And this will apply to some more than others. But let me just kind of wrap it up this way. As an American, I'll fight to defend my country. And I'll fight to defend our freedom. But as a Christian, I will not fight to defend my faith. Because that's not the marching order's from my master, from my king. Uh, we're never told to take up arms to defend our relationship with Christ. In fact, Jesus kind of showed us a different way because he had all the power in the world and he didn't resist when he was taken and beaten and killed. The apostles 
didn't rally to try to figure out how to stage a coup or overthrow the, the people who are persecuting them or form a resistance movement. And so if you come and break into my house to take my stuff, you might get shot. Just saying. Because it's true. And, and, if you, and if you come and break into my house to hurt my family, you will get shot. But if you come to hurt me or my family because we're followers of Jesus Christ, I won't defend myself. I might run and hide because there was some of that in the Bible. But uh, <laughs> I just, that, that's, that's there, but, but I can't fight back. Because the power of God is revealed when we listen to him and we live differently than the world lives. And we believe it enough to apply it to our lives. So today, are you ready? Do you believe Jesus? Because if we believe Jesus, it is a privilege to suffer for him and not a tragedy to suffer for him. But that means every one of us in this room has to think differently and struggle with this and go, God, will I really be happy if I embrace that attitude? Do you really believe the Son of God when he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven? Are we ready? Let's pray. Father, forgive us for clinging so tightly to the comfort and conveniences of this world. Forgive us for loving this world a lot of times more than we love you. And Lord, today set us free from the, the things that have held on to us. Set us free from the things that we've held on to. And let us cling to Jesus with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Let us believe him and live for him. And Lord, if you make it happen, let us die for him. Because heaven is what's waiting for us and we don't have to fear anything in this world because you're going to take care of us no matter what. And so God, our commitment is that we want to praise you and serve you with our lives until our very last breath that we breathe in this world. May we honor you as your sons and daughters of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.